It was a bright and sunny day for Rock as he made his way to Revy's apartment. This was the normal path he took on his strolls to pick her up, especially on a day like today when all hands were on deck. Dutch wasn't the pushy type of boss, but when things got serious, you knew better than to argue with him. And, well, Revy was always the last person to arrive. She never really picked up her phone, assuming that it even worked, and whenever it did, she ignored it. So, it was up to Rock to go and pick up the gunslinger. Arriving to her apartment, it was still as filthy and as trashy as ever, and he had cleaned it three times since he'd been here. She always gave him a would-be thank you and would proceed to trash it just as quickly as he'd managed to clean it up. But now, the situation was urgent, and there was no point in lamenting over the false sense of accomplishment. As Revy was crawling out of bed as Rock would turn her blinds open, lighting her a cigarette to get her day started, Revy wondered what the big deal could be for Dutch to want to assemble the troops so fast. Well, they had a client. The leader of the triads, Mr. Chang. Rowanapur was a place where gangsters fought over territory, and with little interference from law enforcement. In the end, that's what good old corruption gets you. But things usually got pretty serious once buildings started blowing up. The citizens of Rowanapur always knew the signs. It was kind of like DEFCOM. And they knew that they hadn't quite reached DEFCOM 1 yet. If anything, this was a solid 3, but that was nothing to snuff at. If someone was really trying to take out the leader of the triads, then that meant they had to have real balls. Mr. Chang welcomed the opportunity, though. But he was a bit disappointed, arriving to the office of Lagoon Company, and they couldn't even make him a cup of coffee. Seriously, though, Dutch... Mr. Chan said. I mean, it's been a hectic day for me. You'd think that if I was going to be coming to you with some good work, you could at least get me a cup of coffee. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Chen, Dutch said. But if you got that type of trouble on your hands, I don't think you're going to have enough time for a brew. Eh, you're probably right about that. So, what I miss... Revy said as she made her way into the room, Rock following behind as he bowed to Mr. Ching. Always so respectful, eh, Rock? You know, you don't have to bow to me. Yeah, it's an old habit, hard to break. It's all right, kid. In the end, it's always good to be on a pleasant standing with folks. You never know what you might need. So, what's the job? It must be pretty urgent for you to be here first thing in the morning, Revy said in annoyance. It is, it is, and it all has to do with this here briefcase, Mr. Ching said. You see, I had a little bit of trouble. Someone was selling guns on my turf. Now, you know me, I like to think that I'm more tolerable than most, even with Miss Balalaka around. I kept giving him warning after warning, and eventually he didn't get the message, so I had to be very persuasive. And by persuasive, I had to crush to cut off his you-know-what and crush his sack. <laughs> really? But, funny enough, when someone's trying to protect their manhood and their royal oats, they can sing like a songbird, and they start preaching to the choir. And, well... Something tickled my ear. Tell me, have you ever heard of... Shield? Benny's face would tense up at that. Shield? Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, Benny said. Or Shield? They're an organization. Well, keyword was an organization. Yeah, that's them. They used to be a real big deal back in the day, Rock. They were like this international organization of secret super spies. Well, not so secret anymore once stuff got leaked out to the public. What happened to them? 
Uh, good old corruption got taken out from within. Some rogue group of Nazis or whatever. Whole organization had to get taken down. And as a result, a lot of their agents who weren't even involved ended up being on the run. But you see, S.H.I.E.L.D. had a lot of secrets. A lot of dangerous secrets that everyone thought went down with the ship. But the thing is, when you have enough scavengers... You end up finding a thing or two. You see, S.H.I.E.L.D. had these large hovercrafts that could fly in the sky or could ride the waves of the ocean. They were called helicarriers, Mr. Chang would explain. There were five in total when S.H.I.E.L.D. went out of commission. Each helicarrier was taken out in a location all around the world. Now, as you would imagine, even if S.H.I.E.L.D.'s going out of operation... You've got weapons, jets, whole lots of information, anything you could think of. We're talking about next level technology. We're talking about having access to stuff that could make World Wars 1 and 2 look like a fight on the playground. And we're not even talking about stuff that could start World War 3. No, we're talking about, at the very least, World War 7. I mean, it's massive. What's your point? Benny said. Well, the point is, these helicarriers are believed to have been buried at the bottom of the sea. It's very difficult to try to get to one. It's nearly impossible. But for the few that can, even if it's just for a brief moment, they can get their hands on some rather savory stuff. Hell, even if you were just to grab a couple of papers off an old desk you probably have more than enough to set yourself a small fortune. And these papers just happen to be it. Now you see, the CIA in particular want to get their hands on these papers because it wouldn't bode well for Uncle Sam if they got out to the public light. Among other things that are in these dossiers. So, you can imagine my surprise when I'm trying to broker a deal with our good old friends in the U.S. of A., And suddenly, I have people on my neck. So what's the job then, Dutch would ask. The job is simple. There are going to be five teams. Each one's going to be carrying a different briefcase. Now, of course, no team will know which one has the exact. So you can assume this is like a good old game of Schrodinger's cat. I see, Rock would say. So any of us could have the real documents, or none of us could have them. Precisely. In two days' time, you're going to be rendezvousing on an island to the southwest of here. When you do, you'll give them a certain password. There'll be two drivers. And from there, you'll carry on. You know, this is really last minute, Dutch would say. Not sure if we're going to have enough time. Eh, in the end of the day, Dutch, do we ever really have enough time? What do you think, Benny? Dutch said, looking to him. For Rock, he had never seen Benny look like this before. A settling unease was etched all across his face. His normally calm and even lighthearted demeanor had all but vanished. This is serious, Dutch. We need to take this mission. I see. You're not the one that's usually gung-ho about these type of things. So if you think we should take it, then... Look, I know that in the end of the day, we're nothing but pirates and outlaws. And I'm fine with that. But this is one thing that we can't overlook, Dutch. We have to take it. All right, all right. Well, looks like we're going to have no choice but to be in business. Huh, what's that sound outside? Revy said as she opened the blinds. Huh, why are there so many car- Oh, crap. Everyone get the hell out the way! What? What the hell's going on? RPG! The moment that Revy ducked away from the window, Dutch would stand up, his body taking the full brunt of the hit as the window would explode. Well, that's one welcoming party. 
Um, you can just flip me the bill, Dutch. Don't worry. I'll be adding it to the expense. All right, then. We're going to have to break up and get out of here. All right, men. We're going to have to help escort these fine people to their boat. It's been a while since I actually got in the field. I'm looking forward to some action. Rock, you ready? Yeah, don't worry. Revy, you and Benny lead Mr. Chen out the back entrance way. From there, you'll make it to the Black Lagoon. Rock, you'll back me up as we go through the front. That's where most of their forces are going to be piling in. I'll take the shield. I take the spear. Got it. Hey, Rock, Revy said. Don't get yourself killed, you idiot. Don't worry. I have no intentions on dying. Rock reached into his back pocket and pulled out his yellow bandana, tying it over his face, now ready for a fight. As Lagoon Company would make their way out, Mr. Chen, Benny, Revy, and a few others would make their way to the exit at the back door, while Rock and Dutch would take the front. Rock would stand behind Dutch as he charged up his cursed energy into his fist. He wouldn't have to convert it into blessed energy since he wasn't fighting another cursed spirit user, just regular humans, so regular cursed energy would be more than enough. As Dutch would take the full brunt of the machine gun fire right at him, he would go charging in like a bull in a china shop, wrecking through the first wave, as Rock would jump over his shoulders from behind as the second flurry of offense. Dutch would take the forefront in blocking against the firing strikes, and whenever they needed to reload or were out of ammo, that's when Dutch would come in clutch with his striking ability. This was the one-two combo that they had developed together, and they found themselves to be rather effective at it. For Dutch, it was moments like this when he had to remind himself that Rock was no ordinary Japanese businessman. Normally, Rock looked like he couldn't even harm a fly. But when he got into this mode, when he was truly locked in, he looked as though he could rip men to shreds. Although if there was one thing that Dutch found to be lacking... It was that Rock wasn't the type of person to go for the kill. He just didn't really seem to have it in him. He would always leave for lethal damage, breaking bones and other limbs like it was no problem, but he never dealt the killing strike. That's where Dutch came in. Dutch was always there to deliver the final blow to make sure that when they were put down, they stayed down. This was the unspoken compromise that the two of them have made. It wasn't that Rock was above killing, it was just that taking a human life, it wasn't really something that he reveled in. Not that Dutch was some bloodthirsty monster or anything, this was just the nature of the business. In the end, Rock could handle his own just fine. So, if all Dutch had to do was make sure that a neck got turned, or that a skull got cracked, or if a shotgun had to be placed at the right time, then so be it. And that was the compromise that Rock had agreed to. He would take them out. But whoever dealt the killing blow, he just wasn't going to stop them. This worked similarly with Revy. Revy would be the one to deal the failed shots so that Rock didn't have to. On one hand, they kind of thought this was a cop-out. Kind of making them do all the dirty work. But on the other hand, it was kind of something that even Revy wanted. She had actually spoken to Dutch about it privately. Dutch didn't really get what Revy was going for with this little agreement of theirs, but for Revy, this was what she wanted. Whatever Rock was now, she wanted him to stay that way. She didn't want him to become a full-blooded killer like they were. Even if he was a criminal, there was still a part of him that was pure. A part of him that hadn't truly been tainted by this world just yet. And for Revy, if she could protect that innocence, she owed it to him. After all, he was the one that bore the curses of this world on his shoulders. If she could just lighten that load, even if it were just a little bit, then she felt like they were square. Eventually, everyone would make it to the Black Lagoon. And from there, they would carry on in their mission. For Benny, he stayed cooped up in the computer room. 
his mind racing with thoughts of everything that had happened. After so long, he thought that he was finally done with that part of his past. It seemed as though the sins of S.H.I.E.L.D. had now followed him all the way to Rowanaper. Benny never talked very much about his past, only that he was found in Florida by Revy and was saved. But that was all they knew. Of course, Rock would have wanted to learn more, but as they agreed, you don't go digging into someone's past, not unless they want you to. And even then, you have to be careful because you never know what you're going to find. So for now, it was best just to leave the sleeping dogs where they lied. Of course, they weren't the only ones who were out searching for things of the past. But their enemies stayed hidden in the shadows. Eventually, the time to leave for the rendezvous would come. Rock and Revy would be leaving together, arriving to the island where they would be meeting with that said driver. Revy would have the coat in hand, and Rock would be carrying the briefcase. As they made their way through the city, they would eventually find the car that was waiting for them. There was an older man dressed in aviator shades, sitting at the steering wheel, who seemed to have been waiting for their presence. As Revy approached, the two would make small talk, the man seemingly innocent for the most part, until finally... The time came for the password. He gave it to them. May the force be with you. He jokingly said that it was a rather dated type of password and that it didn't really make much sense, but in the end, it seemed to suffice. And Revy would agree. That would suffice. That was the password after all. Just not the real one. What are you talking about? The man said. Oh, the password? That was changed at the last moment. But you would know that if you knew who the real buyer was, Revy said. What? No more wisecracks, old man? I'm pretty sure you got another joke or two, don't you? Come on, make my day. Tell me, tell me another joke, you dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> well, I got a joke. It's just, I don't think you'll actually get it, but your friend over there, Rokuro Okajima, I think he'll get this joke just fine. Still holding on to Revy's hand as they shook, he pulled from his side a blade. Revy was about to pull out her gun, and for Rock, he thought that things had all gone to pot. But when he saw what the shape of that blade was, his heart sank. The man was about to cut Revy's hand off until at the last moment Rock had managed to clear the distance between them, kicking away at the car door and freeing Revy as the blade came slashing down, slashing Rock's left arm and leaving a deep, piercing wound. Fuck! Rock! Revy would say. It seems like they're on to us, Strucker. You might want to come out here. From on top of one of the roofs, a bald man in an old uniform would arrive. On his left hand, he appeared to be wearing a gauntlet. Rock recognized what it was. No way. How the hell do they have a... You recognize this? I bet you do. It's a cursed tool. The inverted spear of heaven. The what? Revy would say. And that there's the devil's claw. I know what they are. Rock would say. But how the hell do you have them? <laughs> well, Rokuro, the man would say, you're not the only one who knows about these sacred items in the world. I have to admit, when I first learned about it, I thought 
this tiny thing? There's no way. But now seeing it firsthand, actually feeling the power that's within it, I have to say, I'm starting to become a believer. And now that this is true, it confirms a lot that I've heard about you and about your kind. My kind? Before Rock even had a chance to prepare his next attack, Strocker would teleport right beside him, kicking Revy far across the ground as he used his clawed hands to grab Rock by the face, slamming his head against the hood of the car and knocking him out cold before putting bindings onto his arms and grabbing the briefcase as they loaded him up and prepared their getaway. As Revy got a hold of her bearings, she saw that Rock had been taken away and those that remained were attempting to take her life. Thankfully enough, help would come from an unexpected source. It came in the form of a woman wearing a traditional Chinese dress, carrying around two blades as she immediately jumped into the air and started slashing away at the enemies as Revy would shoot them down. As they attempted their getaway, the driver would be hurrying up for the two women to climb in. Unfortunately, the bladed fighter would lose her blades in the process, but that didn't mean she was out of options. As they drove off, Revy recognized immediately who had come to her aid. It was none other than Chang's own personal assassin, Xuan Hua, along with one of his designated drivers, La Harch. But in this underworld, they were known by much different names. <laughs> so, the famed Revy needed our help. Hmm, I don't need to take that from you, Ching. If you say Changlish again, I will show you why I am known as Lady Deathstrike. You two-bit wannabe cowboy gunslinging bitch. All right, all right, the driver would say. Enough with your cat fighting and all that nonsense. I'm having a bloody headache. What serves you right? No one told you to take down three bottles of Jack Daniels before the mission. Drinking Jack Daniels is the only way I can get through this shit show. Right now, we need to go back to base. Fuck that, Revy would say. We need to go back and save Rock and get back that briefcase. If we show up empty-handed, Chang's not really going to be too happy with any of us now, is he? Are you serious? You want us to go charge him back into some military death camp. We know about what your good boy Rokoro can do, and he just got turned into a little wuss. If he can't do anything, what makes you think you're going to be any better? Because I'm the bitch that's got the balls, and I've got the gun. Now do it! Ay, if I wasn't in such a hammered state... I'd turn around and I'd scream your pretty little ears off. Whatever. Fine! As the car would make its turn, Revy and her unlikeliest of allies would make the charge to save Rock. In the meantime, Dutch would be given a call about what transpired. And with Benny becoming every more restless... He looked into an old briefcase for something he didn't think he'd ever have to use again. You sure about that? Dutch would say. You always said you'd never use it. Yeah, and I would have preferred if I had kept it that way. It's all in the past now, Benny boy. There's no need to go dredging it up. It won't make things any better. I said that I'd let this part of me go when I felt like I atoned for everything. And this, this only proves that I've got far, far off the mark. I'm going to have to make a call. Who, to Balalaka's girl? You know she hates you after what happened. Yeah, but maybe it's time I started explaining myself better. If she doesn't like your answer, you know she's going to try to kill you. Maybe it's for the best. 
but I can't let this come back. It's time to get out the truth and put all of this away once and for all. So maybe just one more time, I can be this thing again. Benny would pull out of the briefcase a black uniform, a mask with golden trim and a hood, and a long, a short-sighted blade, the last blade he ever wielded. This sword held a lot of significance for Benny. It was the sword that made him famous, or rather, the sword that made him infamous. So many lives were changed and cut down with this blade. And yet he could never depart from it. And from the man that taught him so much. If just for one more time. To right the wrongs of his past. Then the Ronin. Must step out again. In the meantime, Rock would awaken to see that his arm had been bandaged, although he was tightly secured to a chair and there were binding seals placed all around them. This was the work of Jujutsu. He saw that the man that was wielding the inverted spear of heaven was twirling it around in his hand. Well, now, you're awake. I was beginning to worry about you there, Rokuro. Who, who am I? I've been called a lot of names, but if I have to give you one, let's say one that's most suitable, the name's Masahiro. Masahiro Tanaka. Masahiro Takanaka? How, how do I have this? Well, Rock... We've been studying your kind for a while now. Of course, at first I didn't understand the full gist of it, but Jujutsu sorcerers and cursed spirits, secret exorcists, devils hiding in plain sight, among other things. Safe to say, those monsters that go bump in the night aren't just fairy tale. How do you have it? It was supposed to be, supposed to be hidden away, destroyed in the battle. I know that's what you're thinking, but you see, we've had people following for a while now. For a long time, they've kept their distance, of course, but we know all about your little friends back in Tokyo. Satoru Gojo, Principal Yaga... Who do you think recruited some of the best assassins in the world? And among them is one that you know very well. A member of the Zenin clan, or at least he used to be. Toji Fushiguro. You know Fushiguro. I didn't know him personally, but he did a lot of work for a lot of people, including our organization, That's how we were able to learn about your existence. Of course, you'd color me surprised that someone with all this power decided to settle down and become a businessman. So stereotypical, too. Come on. Could have been anything, but you became the good old-fashioned Japanese businessman. Your senses are dull. I can tell you've got fighting prowess. I bet if this were 10 years ago, you would have been able to save that girl and not get cut in the process or be taken off guard by my good friend Strocker here. But I can see that in your time of peace, you've been dulled. A blade that's lost its edge. But enough with all that. You want to know what's in the briefcase? I don't know. And even if I did, you wouldn't tell me. Yeah, I figured that. Your briefcase was empty. You don't know anything after all, but you're still pretty valuable to us, so we're going to keep you around. You mind? 
Masahiro would say as the men would leave the room. Even Strucker. Do not let your guard down, comrade. Ah, don't worry, I won't. I just want to speak man to man. I want to know. All about you, Rock. Your story. What led you to the most God-forsaken city in the world? This concludes Black Lagoon, City of the Dead, What If Revy Was the Punisher, Season 1, Part 6. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that's to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned tomorrow as we continue and conclude Black Lagoon, City of the Dead. What if Revy was the Punisher, Season 1, Part 7, the Season 1 finale. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings, signing off, and I'll see you next time.